My name is uh, John Floretta, and I work at uh, JPAL. And JPAL is the host for Clear Center in South Asia, which is the Center on Learning and Evaluation for Results. Uh, and at Clear, basically, over the, we've been hosting it since 2011. And over the last year and a half, we've been holding kind of regular meetings uh, to bring together people from the evaluation community to share best practices and share new methods. And so we're really happy to be to host our sixth M&E roundtable uh, together with 3IE. Uh, so 3IE is the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation. And they are a donor organization that funds impact evaluations randomized control trials and quasi-experimental evaluations. And they're also one of the leaders uh, in, in doing systematic reviews, both funding systematic reviews, uh, writing systematic reviews, and doing capacity building around systematic reviews. I'll try to give a little bit of a background of what a, a systematic review is. Um, so at JPAL and at 3IE and at CLEAR, we talk about we, we want to move to a direction of evidence-based policy making. And that raises the question of kind of, first of all, what is, what is evidence? Um, and evidence, you know, is, is, is what, we, what we're referring to as evidence is the result of, of high quality evaluations, whether it be a randomized control trial, whether it be quasi-experimental with a strong comparison group, whether it be good qualitative evidence, that this evidence, this, the results of evaluations, ultimately should be used to shape better policy. And there's a question about then how you go about doing that. So there's lots of, you know, there, there's a lot more space for further high quality primary research, especially in developing countries, but there is quite a bit of research that's already been done. So how does this research then translate into policy change and, and better practices? And we have to admit that there's a pretty high cost of going through all of the primary research, assessing its quality, and then trying to derive the lessons out of that. So if you're sitting, say, in the Ministry of Education, uh, in a developed country or a developing country, and are trying to understand what are the good practices that I can use to shape my policies, it, it, it's a very high cost to, to do that, that systematic review of evidence. So what 3IE is doing in the international space is kind of, of lowering that cost by providing this public good of a systematic review. And we'll get much more into the detail of what these are, but essentially it's taking a research question. Say the question is, what are effective ways to increase school participation, whether it's attendance or reducing dropout rates or enrollment, and then doing a systematic search of all of the evidence, uh, meeting a preset criteria or a protocol in that area, synthesizing across that evidence, and then, and then sharing the results. So what a policymaker gets is not necessarily a, you know, a guide for implementation. What a policymaker will get is kind of a general sense of, of it was globally or it can be done regionally, what's the evidence around that around that issue, and that can be kind of a starting point, a general starting point for policy making. So it's, it is an attempt to look at what works, um, but as we'll get into, you know, it's not, we know it's not as simple as kind of finding what works, quote unquote. It's kind of finding which programs work, uh, when, for who, and why. And so this, this process of systematic reviews, they first started in uh, public health, then they started uh, kind of in the environment sector. And 3IE is one of the leading organizations together with uh, Cochrane and the Campbell collaboration of bringing, 3IE, of bringing uh, systematic reviews to the international space. So how we're set up today is we're gonna have three presentations, four presentations. Three will be from 3IE and one will be from the Cochrane Public Health Satellite. And rather than kind of go through and give you the, 
uh, to have a presentation just on the methodology. We're going to weave in the methodology to the presentations. So Hugh Waddington, who's a senior evaluation specialist at 3IE, is going to start out with a systematic review of water supply and sanitation evaluations. And within that, he's going to cover the, the methodological topics of how you do the search, the search for different uh, evidence, and then the statistical meta-analysis. So that'll be followed by about 10 minutes of Q&A. Then uh, the next presentation is uh, by Britta uh, Snilsvit. She's also an evaluation specialist at 3IE. And she's going to focus on a systematic review of, farm, of farmer field schools. And within that, she's going to bring in the methodological aspects of a causal chain analysis and <coughs> of qualitative synthesis of results. Then we'll break for about 10, 20 minutes for, for tea and coffee just right outside. And unfortunately, so we're very lucky to have, so Hugh and uh, uh, Britta are both from the systematic review office at 3IE, which is based in London, and they have flights today. <laughs> so you should get their, your questions in for them during the Q&A, because during the coffee break, they'll have to leave. Um, then we'll have Howard White will be the next presenter. Howard's the executive director of, of 3IE. And he's going to do a systematic review, cover a systematic review of education, I believe focusing on, on attendance, enrollment, attendance, and, and dropouts. Um, and then the, the methodological aspect that he's going to bring in is lumping versus splitting. And Howard will have to get into exactly what that is. Um, and so in, in the, the fourth and final presentation will be by uh, Ruhi Saith. So Ruhi has many, many hats, uh, and she is also one of the people, she's done many 3IE systematic reviews. Uh, she's a professor at, at JNU. Uh, she's also with Oxford, has been with Oxford Policy Management, and she is helping to the kind of lead the setup of a Cochrane public health satellite, so Cochrane collaboration here, here in India. So Cochrane collaboration has been fo focusing on systematic reviews uh, in public health. Um, and so then we will then have 30 minutes for general discussion at the end. And the general discussion, so let's, I guess let's try to get the, as many of the questions we can about the specific systematic reviews in the 10-minute Q&A following each presentation. And then in the, the final 30 minutes, um, we can ask kind of larger questions about the methodology, uh, as well as any kind of follow-up questions that you might have. So on behalf of uh, JPAL and, and on behalf of Clear South Asia, you can thank all of you very much for, for coming. Um, we also have uh, what I hope is quite a few people that are joining us by webinar. At our last seminar series, we had 200 people joining by webinar. So thank you for joining as well. And I will turn over to my colleague Sri Sen to introduce the first speaker. Sri. Thank you, John. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to explain the format of the roundtable a little bit. Each panelist will present for about 30 minutes. Then we'd um, have a 10-minute round of question and answers. We'd take about two or three questions at a time and then allow the speakers to answer them before taking another round of questions. Um, also, at the end of the session, everyone has been given a folder and there are feedback forms. So if everyone could fill those out and hand it back to either Priya or Rashmi. Okay. Um, our first speaker today is Hugh Waddington who will be presenting on systematic review of water supply and sanitation. He was an economist and manages 3IE systematic review program and the Campbell Collaboration International Development Coordinating Group. Welcome, Hugh. Great. Thank you so much. So thanks a lot for inviting us here. Um, OK. Um, so actually, interestingly um, enough, um, the, the field of systematic review and meta-analysis actually began in the social sciences in the uh, U United States academia, although it has been adopted by um, the uh, medicine and public health. Um, um, so um, today, uh, I'm going to try to give you some uh, an overview of, of two main things. First of all, the, the purpose of research synthesis, that is taking lots of evidence and taking all of the evidence, synthesizing it and trying to make sense of it for policy. Um, and secondly, I'm going to present um, the, 
the results from a systematic review that we did on water, sanitation, hygiene interventions in controlling child diarrhea. Um, so, um, this is a, a quote just for the, for the economists in the room, and I'm an economist, so I tend to put up quotes by economists. Um, so, um, uh, this is a quote from Edward Lima's famous article, Let's Take the Con Out of Econometrics, from the early 1980s, in which he's basically, the basic sense of this quote is, don't trust anything that you read in an econometrics journal. Um, and I think that's, that's, part, that's part of the reason why we do systematic reviews. So a systematic review, um, as opposed to a literature review, um, does do, as John was saying, um, uh, critically appraises the literature and, and, and all of the literature, not just that literature which is written by the person writing the review and their friends in academia. But I, I much prefer the way that Dean Carlin said it at a conference more recently, which is that literature reviews are like sausages, I don't eat sausages, sausages as, as I don't know what goes into them. Uh, a systematic review, you know exactly what goes into, into it. Uh, so um, this, th this is the logo of the Cochrane Collaboration, uh, which, in which encapsulates um, a, a, a well-known systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, so uh, the logo basically um, shows what's called a forest plot. A forest plot is, is how we represent a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis being a um, statistical pooling of study effect sizes to come up with a, um, an average finding across all of the studies. And so in the case of the Cochrane logo, um, uh, there, there were s studies which were assessing um, the effects of corticosteroid treatment on premature births, uh, um, survival. Um, and if, if we just looked at the individual studies using a, a, a vote counting analysis, so we basically tallied up um, X number of studies find a positive outcome and X number of studies find a negative or, 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 or zero outcome, what we'd find is... It's not going to get that far, is it? Yeah. Um, okay. So, so it doesn't matter. Um, so, so basically, if if you look at these these lines uh, in this forest plot in the centre of the Cochrane logo, the vertical line is the point is the line of no effect. So any any um, s s and the horizontal lines are the 95% um, confidence intervals for individual studies. So what are the confidence bounds for an individual study? And any of those horizontal lines which crosses the vertical line is a study which shows an insignificant finding. And if we just tallied up the studies, um, looking, doing a vote count, what we, would, what we would have found is that two studies supported uh, corticosteroid treatment in reducing uh, mortality amongst uh, premature births, and five studies didn't find any effect. And so we would have concluded wrongly that um, the treatment wasn't effective. How, whereas, if, if we actually treat the studies as part of a larger population of studies, taking into account the fact that five of the studies are clearly underpowered, and we calculate our pooled meta-analysis finding, which is the diamond in the bottom, what we actually find is a a, a 30%, 50%, thir between 30 and 50% reduction in mortality resulting from the treatment. This treatment has now been enrolled out and an estimate, estimated thousands of, of lives have been saved. Um, so, why is a systematic review not, it's not a literature review. Now, frequently we get applications to our grants program. We've held five calls for systematic reviews so far and many times we get in the, in the, uh, proposals. I've done all of these systematic reviews, and, and generally people are turning to literature reviews. A systematic review is, is like a scientific literature review that follows from a study protocol um, in which you collect all of the evidence, uh, both published and unpublished. Um, so, so for a study of effects, um, it needs to be exhaustive. Um, the audience is policymakers or practitioners. It's not research people, so there's a lot of um, translation work which is required. Um, the, the process is very clear, so it involves teams in which two or more people uh, search, um, critically appraise, and synthesize literature, um, and which is set out in a study, uh, ex ante in a study protocol. Um, the critical appraisal stage is much more than you'd normally find in a, in a lit review, so you're basically two people are assessing the, uh, the, how much we trust the inferences made in the study. Um, to at least the standards you'd expect in a top quality journal, and that's then reported in, in the paper itself. Uh, and finally, um, rather than using vote counting or, or more 
um, scientifically null hypothesis significance testing. Um, a good systematic review, where possible, should uh, synthesize effect sizes using meta-analysis, weighting studies by, by precision, by, the sample, by a measure of the sample size. So um, here's a, a case in which you'll all be familiar. So um, um, we believe this is an il illustrative case of why to do systematic reviews. So we all know the Miguel and Kramer paper on deworming, uh, which found a significant effects on school attendance, um, has been very influential. There's an international NGO uh, called Deworm the World, and, and there have been large deworming programs in Kenya and India. Um, however, a systematic review of the evidence which came out, which was updated last year, um, found that um, I'm just going to read out the quote. It's pro probably misleading to justify contemporary de deworming programs based on evidence of consistent benefit on school attendance or school performance, as if there is simply insufficient reliable information to know whether this is so. So, in other words, um, we're still making, we're still rolling out global policy based on single studies, and this is a this is a point which Howard is going to talk about, I think, in the third presentation, um, at, at which which we believe um, um, is. It is, is inappropriate for lots of reasons. Um, um, the, a, a major reason being that um, that we that we actually need to critically appraise the evidence, and we need to collect all the evidence, not just the favourable stories, which we think um, um, supports our case. So, so systematic reviews. I mean, John's very nicely summarised all of this already. There's a huge amount of literature. It's, it's for, for a researcher, let alone a policy maker, there's, they don't have sufficient time to go through it. So we're trying to build up a, a, a library of, of evidence from systematic reviews. Um, um, we also know that um, there are particular problems with published literature, uh, which in, in that published studies are much more likely to be presented in, in journals and are much more likely to, to be found in, in the most well-known journals, So, um, which is why the search needs to be so... Um, if, uh, comprehensive, um, and also I, I suppose the main point is the the, the deworming points that the, the benefits of single studies that they are they are context specific, time specific, um, play, um, population specific. Um, are they are precisely their weaknesses when we're trying to generalise to make um, more generalizable global uh, policy recommendations? So um, when we do a systematic review, probably. Uh, a quarter of the time is spent on searching, which does sound quite rather daunting. Um, and and you're, you're, you are looking through um, uh, different sources of literature, so you're not just looking through the, um, uh, uh, the most well-known database. If, if it's a study on an economic topic, you're not just going to be looking at econ lit. You're also going through, you're going through both database sources, so electronic sources, both published and unpublished. Um, but also hand searching of print sources, websites, um, um, this kind of thing. Um, and, and most importantly, and, and what we found particularly helpful is um, doing various snowballing. So snowballing includes both checking through reference lists of papers um, to check to, to check the literature, the historical literature, but also forward uh, tracking studies uh, through citation tracking services. Um, and contacting researchers, and we actually find that a lot of um, a lot of primary study authors um, are, are happy to share their their results with us of, of forthcoming studies. Oh. Okay. Uh, so, um, um, in three IE's program, and as, as John's already said, the answering the the what works question is actually part of a broader set of, of questions, and we we are interested in knowing what works and what doesn't. And this is kind of where we started the systematic re reviews program. Is the primary purpose of doing a, pretty much all three IE studies need to answer a what works question, drawing on rigorous experimental and quasi experimental um, findings, but but. Uh, the systematic views, they're not just going to present an average treatment effect. We, we, we care about whether, where treatments work and for which people. Um, uh, and so we're, we're interested also in the uh, 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 for whom and, and when uh, question. Um, thirdly, the why question, which, which we've been 
um, piloting in our farmer field school study, and Bert is going to be talk, talking about. And the, the why question is really the, um, the question that we believe is of, of relevance to the practitioners, by which I mean people designing and implementing programs. Uh, because if a, program w if a program doesn't work, we need to know whether it just doesn't work in theory or whether it doesn't work in, work in practice, so there's implementation failure. But there are also other reasons why we might uh, believe a program works or doesn't, which you'll see in my presentation later relating to, to, to measurement error. And finally, uh, we want to know, um, looking across the evidence uh, of, of, from lots of different programs, so typically a systematic review will look at just one program and it will do um, a very detailed causal chain analysis of that one program. But looking across programs, what uh, the, the question uh, um, uh, which Howard's going to be speaking about is, is for, for uh, reviews of uh, comparative reviews of effects, so which interve interventions are the most effective and cost effective for achieving a particular policy goal. Um, so that's the general introduction to SRs. Um, now I'm going to move on to, uh, water, um, to the water and sanitation study. So we should have a pile of publications. Did they arrive this morning? Yes, okay. So publications at the back, they're all free. Please take them, otherwise we don't want to have to take them back with us, so uh, we'd be grateful. Um, uh, so, so this is from the WHO Global Burden of Disease, um, uh, uh, showing that diarrhea, diarrheal disease, um, is the second major cause of, of under five deaths uh, around the world, uh, and a major cause of, of, of diarrhea disease tran transmission. Um, um, is the, uh, the 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 water cycle and the um, uh, the uh, it, it essentially um, this is the uh, the F's diagram of 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 disease transmission. So uh, basically, people are eating their own shit. They're not aware of it, um, and these are the main routes through which that shit enters enters our bodies um, and gives us diarrhea. Um, and the, the interventions which are in the WASH sector um, act on certain disease transmission routes. So uh, we have sanitation, which breaks the transmission of diseases in the first round, and sanitation by which I mean latrines, um, um, ensuring open defecation-free areas and um, um, connection to the, the public sewage, sewage system. But then there are these second round transmission routes um, 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 which, which break the transmission from um, people's f uh, fingers being dirty uh, through, that's hand washing, um, uh, flies, fields, and uh, fluids in the case of, of, of water. Um, this is slightly different a uh, representation of that figure. So that figure is from um, Sandy Cairncross, who you all know is the, uh, one of the world's leading experts in this area. Um, um, part of the problem with um, um, these, these kind of figures is that um, they don't really factor in the, the, um, how it actually works on the ground. Um, and let's say that um, uh, in the case of a, a water supply intervention, we provide clean water at source to people. However, in, people don't drink at source. People carry that water and then they store it in their homes and then they uh, typically in a bucket which they'll dip their hands into to, to pour out of. Um, which basically leads to recontamination of the, of the water. So, so one of the theories is that, um, that if, if your objective is to, is to improve health, as, as measured by diarrhea and other, other types of um, waterborne diseases, um, providing um, clean water at source isn't, isn't going to solve the problem because the water becomes recontaminated through, through the fingers roots, as you can see here. Um, so basically, you need to, to treat water in the household or provide a, a clean storage after, after source water treatment. Um, I just generally, um, I, on the extent of the problem, um, these are, this is from the most recent um, um, UNMDGs report from last year. Um, the, the top figure on the left-hand side in, in um, um, the, the, the countries in orange are those countries which are off track. So most of the world, in the top figure on the left-hand side is, is the water supply, um, global water supply um, um, progress. Uh, as you can see, uh, Africa's uh, um, the, the main area where um, there's an there's a, a enormous problem. And secondly, um, the bottom picture is on sanitation. And again, we have um, um, uh, Africa, but also India, and a large, most of South Asia being, being off track. And actually, um, South Asia is the, 
um, contains the, 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 the most people in the world which don't have access to adequate sanitation. So, and, and in fact, 60% of those practicing open defecation, for example, live in India. Okay, so um, we actually did this review about four years ago. Um, we're, we're updating it at the moment now because it, it's such a productive area of work. Um, there's so many studies coming out all the time. So uh, we're currently conducting the update. The original systematic review report uh, contained some 70 interventions. There's been at least 30 additional studies conducted since then, which we envisage will be included in the review. So we did an extensive search of both published and unpublished sources. Um, um, and the inclusion criteria for the review, unlike the Pharma Field Schools review, we, we solely restricted this review to um, experimental and quasi-experimental studies, uh, which were reporting the effects of specific water sanitation and or hygiene interventions um, in low or middle income countries on uh, child disease, um, on child diarrhea morbidity um, under non-outbreak conditions. So those are the inclusion criteria which we determined in before we did the, the analysis. Um, so just to say that um, um, the, when in a systematic view and a meta-analysis, the unit of analysis is, is the study level effect size. Um, so so and what we've done is we, we turn the summary information which is reported in the two by two table or the regression table, we turn that into a measure which represents both the magnitude of effect, um, so how much of, uh, what percentage or what uh, reduction in terms of numbers of standard deviations in the outcome variable there is um, due to the intervention uh, as measured against the control group. So in some cases, that information is reported in a two-by-two two table. That's more typical in epidemiological literature. Um, in the economics literature, um, we, we generally report results in regression tables. So, um, um, and, and just as a, as a word of interpretation, um, what we're going to be measuring today is a negative outcome. So in other words, we're measuring diarrheal disease morbidity. Um, so a reduction in desire, diarrheal disease morbidity in the treatment group as compared to the control group is a positive benefit, which, um, um, which will be in a forest plot like this, um, uh, shown as a, um, a shift to the left of the line of no effect. So, so this is our kind of... Um, overall findings. So if we just did the meta-analysis in which we found 70 studies um, um, and we pulled the results for, for separate, separately by intervention, um, this, this is what we found. So each of these diamonds is a separate meta-analysis. So the diamond at the top shows the effects across all of the studies of water supply or water quantity um, on child diarrhea morbidity. Um, the second one is, uh, and that contains something like 10 studies, so, so it's, there just isn't enough space on this graph to show it, but there's 10 studies which make up that, that diamond, that pooled effect size. Um, the sec in the second case, we have water quality interventions. In the third case, sanitation. The fourth, hyg hygiene interventions, hand washing, etc. Uh, and finally, combined interventions, so lots of interventions together. Um, and basically, overall, what we find is um, if we look across the studies and don't do any further in-depth analysis, um, um, that uh, providing water, just uh, improved water supply doesn't lead to any imp improvements in disease as measured by uh, diarrhea rates. Um, it's actually water quality, so water treating the water which makes a difference. Um, similarly, um, sanitation, um, the, the width of the diamond shows the confidence interval, so how, and which basically relates to how many studies and how closely together they are, um, how, how precisely we're measuring the estimate. So, so we, we estimate a somewhat lesser effect on sanitation, but there really aren't very many studies. Um, and, I, and I'm not going to talk about the sanitation literature, mainly because, it, because it's so weak. There really aren't very many good studies on sanitation. Um, I think there's, there's two, random, two RCTs um, which are in progress at the moment. Um, um, hygiene interventions um, I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to focus my, my, uh, the rest of the presentation on water quality and hygiene, and specifically how you can use meta-analysis um, to explain the findings from um, the, to explain the overall findings so you're go, going beyond the average treatment effect. Um, so here's a um, meta-analysis. This, this shows, this um, shows the... Um, 
Um, individual studies which make up the... Have you got the, um, the microphone I can, I can carry? Yeah. So, so this... this um, well, perhaps I'll share it. Oh, no. No, you know, we're here. So, so, so this, this um, larger forest plot shows the individual studies which made up the diamond in, in the first forest plot I showed. So you can see that there's a large number of studies which assess water quality. So by water quality, I'm talking about an intervention which treats or protects um, water and so makes it safe to drink, it makes it potable water. And, and what we the first point we did was we separated the studies into, um, uh, into uh, um, interventions which provided improved water quality at the point of use. So in other words, a household water treatment device like a filtration device or a storage bucket or um, um, various other, other ways of, of decontaminating water at, at, the, at the household level. And several other studies which, which provided um, uh, safe water at the source. And, and what we found is that we look across the studies that um, we, we do see a, um, a larger reduction in the, in the household water treatment than the, um, the, the uh, source water treatment, which, which um, we expect is, is due to the uh, re is due to the recontamination um, from uh, during the process of tra transport and storage in the household. Um, so these are the these are the two things to be to be focusing on here. The this is the pooled meta-analysis finding. Um, however, um, when we're looking in greater in depth at the water quality studies, and this is work done by uh, Sandy Cairncross. Um, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, when they actually looked at the um, uh, placebo-controlled studies of, of water quality, what they found was that despite um, uptake rates, um, they didn't find that they didn't find any uh, um, improvements in the treatment group over the control uh, for water quality interventions. So, so, it, and this is partly um, um, because the. The outcome is, is being self-reported, so, um, um, uh, and, and we know that, um, you, you know, you have uh, um, Hawthorne effects, um, John Henry effects, um, um, and, 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 and it's, it, there's a suspicion in the literature now that, that because of Hawthorne effects, um, that the, the water quality literature just, just um, um, isn't believable. So there are studies which are ongoing now, which are collecting information on, um, on, on, on more um, objective um, outcomes, hard, harder outcomes. Um, this is some analysis that we did in our study where we, where we compared um, uh, diarrheal disease outcomes with process outcomes, so measures of um, whether con water was contaminated or not. So they basically, they do a, um, uh, an assessment of the uh, pathogen loads in the water in the, in the household. And, and what, what we found looking across the studies is that we don't find a consistent um, relationship between the um, process outcomes and the, and the final outcomes. Um, so this is questioning the, the scientific validity of, of this literature. And, and I should say that this literature is large, is, is, there's a significant number of randomized control trials in this literature. So it's a large number of, 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 of but, but mainly efficacy studies. And so when we move on to looking at um, sustainability over time, um, uh, and here's a, a, a second meta-analysis where we're breaking, grouping the studies according to the length of follow-up period. Uh, what we find is a, a, a substantial reduction in, in, in disease uh, um, in, in in disease rates in the treatment groups for water quality intervention. So this is represented by this shift of the diamond for water quality um, um, to the right-hand side. So studies um, um, which looked, these are studies which looked, which measured um, outcomes a year or more. Um, and there's, there's um, additional literature which, which looks at follow-ups amongst complier groups um, uh, amongst treatment groups over time. So after the intervention has ended, um, there's at least four cases from our systematic review which, have, which found that compliance rates fell remarkably. Um, so in, in the case of um, 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 
uh, in the worst case uh, was in Guatemala, um, which was a, a water dis dis disinfectant trial. Um, um, and basically, af after one year later, only 5% of the households were actually using the, the intervention. So on to, on to hygiene interventions. So um, again, um, hygiene interventions, um, largely efficacy trials, quite a lot of RCTs. So um, w at least in terms of, and if we, just if we just looked at the studies in terms of the fact that it was an RCT, we would think, oh yeah, there's a, there's a very nice, very good quality of literature. Um, and when we looked, so we've broken down the studies into soap trials and hygiene in education, um, um, and we didn't find a, a very big difference. Again, we found similar to water quality, some 30 to 40 percent reduction in diarrhea in the efficacy studies. Um, um, but, and this is this is from the new findings from the search update. Um, there, there have been at least three new studies which have gone beyond efficacy to scale up hygiene interventions. So. Um, and, and they've scaled it up through various ways. So in Vietnam, they've used, there's been an RCT, um, which came out last year, um, which did scaling up through uh, mass media um, and then interpersonal communication. Um, in Peru, um, there's, uh, they used mass media and uh, community level and community level promotion through health facilities and schools. Um, and in Bangladesh, um, they use community hygiene promoters. In, in all of these cases, they found no effects on, um, on health or, or, and other outcomes. Now, clearly the message is that at an efficacy level, um, um, uh, the intervention appears to work. The, the point is, how do we then go to scale? So how do we actually, w which are the um, behavioral uh, change communication um, methods which are working. So, so we, at least we have authors which are which are attempting to use different different methods to to um, to assess this problem. But at the moment, the the results from scaling up using these um, methods um, are, haven't hasn't been promising. Okay, so um, I'm going to finish there um, on time for once. So, thank you. Um, you can download the report. There's there were free copies out there. We are updating the study, which will hopefully be in the Campbell Library in the not too different distant future. Thank you. So, we have around 10 minutes for, for Q&A for, for Hugh's presentation. Um, to take two or three questions at a time. We'll do a couple of rounds if we can. Um, hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, Hugh, for your presentation. I'm Arundhati from PHFI. Um, so from your presentation, I gather that systematic reviews are actually quite powerful in pointing out gaps in both interventions as well as research if we're looking at a particular health issue. So what do you do with a systematic review? How does this then go back to informing better interventions, better research, um, and then, of course, uh, funding for those research studies and interventions? And we'll just take another question as well. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. That was very useful. I'm just curious, you know, we're, w the results you're throwing up is actually showing where it's been effective, where it's been not effective. Then do you go into round two if you want to look at the cost effectiveness, sustainability, um, you know, the kind of environment that you need? Uh, how, do you, how do you capture that? Madhumita, can you introduce yourself? Sorry, um, I'm Madhumita Gupta. I'm actually the mission economist at USAID. Um, and we're also looking very carefully at um, how do you do the learning part of the m and &E system. So, you know, USAID is actually looking at MEL right now with a focus on learning, and that's what we're trying to capture, and we're trying to set up a framework within the mission. So I'm very interested, how do you actually do that? Great. That's Sri, why don't you pass to, to Hugh to answer these oh, first two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then we'll, we'll do another round in a second. Okay, thanks, yes. Um, okay, so um, so the question on how do we use SR for research, so you're, you're not interested, I presented on the policy bit, what, what you're interested in to clarify is how we use it for, for funding future research, correct? 
research and interventions. Okay, so so actually, um, when uh, and and the systematic reviews program was set up by Howard very early on in in 3IE's program. It, I think the, the first call we ever did was for systematic that 3IE ever did was for systematic reviews. Uh, that was in late 2008, and they were primarily we primarily envisaged that actually we would use the systematic reviews program. Uh, it, exactly as you as you state, to find out where the gaps were in the in the evidence, and then we would use that to fund future intervention studies. Um, or they would find the gaps in the evidence, or they would find where um, so we could avoid duplication, but also um, um, encourage replication where it would be beneficial, where there were where there were promising studies. Um, so um, um, we actually. One of the, when you report a systematic review, you report implications for policy. Um, many systematic reviews, incidentally, don't report many implications for policy because there isn't very much evidence, and which is why we um, promote a more integrated synthesis, which Bert is going to be presenting for pharma field schools, so, so, that, so that we can at least provide information for um, not just what to fund, but also how to improve implementation. And so, so basically, um, um, and, and when you see the the the, uh, the implications section of a systematic review, you'll see both the implications for research and practice, um, but also um, sorry for policy and practice, but also implications for research. Um, so, secondly, um, on the yes round two question, um, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, the basis, the the basics of these. I've kind of presented the basics. The first slide I presented was that we just do the simple, collect all the evidence, abstract the statistical information, and do the meta-analysis. But the really interesting stuff and the really stuff which is we believe is informative to implementers is actually the uh, doing the subgroups analysis, like I presented, um, if uh, looking at perhaps where the programs are particularly successful um, um, or for which people. Um, and so one method of doing it was the way I presented it was basically by grouping studies according to particular contextual factors and estimating effects in that way. You can also use, if you have sufficient studies, use um, more, um, I hate to use the word, multivariate methods, so more like meta-regression to look at lots of different um, um, correlation or find um, uh, factors, uh, factors together. Um, sustainability, um, some of these questions can be answered with a subgroups with meta-analysis. Other questions um, um, may, may only be answerable with sufficient studies or may not be answerable at all without, um, the, without engaging with the qualitative literature. And, it, and so for our pharma field schools study, I think it's fair to say that we haven't really been able to um, strongly um, um, make strong recommendations about sustainability due to the ex extent of the limited extent of the quantitative literature, but we can go some way in in teasing out a theory using the, the qualitative literature. And yes, um, I, I would see um, it, it's this, the same issue would be around cost effectiveness. There are some reviews which look at cost effectiveness, and we realise that it's cost effectiveness which is of key importance if you're trying to determine which programs. Uh, to, to affect, to achieve a particular policy objective. Um, but m very many s uh, systematic reviews don't usually engage with that. It's usually a secondary piece. We're hoping um, and we're funding systematic reviews which are looking at, at, at those kind of questions. So, um, <coughs> just to add a couple of points. So on the sustainability, I think the presentation does illustrate two ways in which you can tackle sustainability. So one, as Hugh mentioned, is subgroup analysis, and that was one of the last slides that showed the effect size, um, the average treatment effect on diarrhea reduction was much less if you looked at studies that took place measuring outcomes over 12 months after the intervention took place, whereas if you measured it in the first less than 12 months, you found a much larger impact. So the impact's declining over time. So you see that effect of lack of sustainability. Why is it, again, it was on one of Hugh's slides, there's not only limited adoption of the intervention, there's disadoption. So if you go back a year later, far fewer people are using the intervention. This is particularly true for point of use water treatment because chlorination of your water, filtration, it's a hassle. Yeah? People don't want to do it. They, they give up. And they don't, we have some discussion about why this might be. And what is recognized in the literature is 
it's much harder to persuade people to do something where the benefit is something not going to happen. What's not going to happen to your child is not going to get diarrhea. But that's, so it's not the same as you're going to get something, something is not going to happen. And, and the fact is that you know, diarrhea rates are maybe around 12% or so, and it goes down from 12% to, to 9%. Yeah, children get diarrhea. I don't care. It happens. They'll get better. So, to, as something that a third piece of evidence we have from another review, which is at the back, um, that confirms this view, is a systematic review we had looked at willingness to pay studies. And the fact is, people are not willing to pay for clean water. They're willing to pay for water access, but the willingness to pay for clean water is less than the cost of provision. So, and the same factors explain that. So, sustainability and how you can cost effectively provide clean water is, is actually a real challenge. Um, I, had, I myself had a question for Hugh, but I'm going to answer it as well. Um, <laughs> you, so Hugh talks a lot about efficiency, effectiveness and effic efficacy studies. I just wanted to, to clarify what that is. So um, when we do drug trials in, in the health sector, the, what's called the, the third level trials <coughs> are often what we consider efficacy trials. They're seeing whether the drug works under ideal circumstances, if it's administered in the way it's meant to be administered, and often they use what we call ideal patients. So a lot of drug trials are done on 18 to 20 year old college students, for example. But we don't give drugs to 18 to 20 year old college students, we give them to people in their 60s at risk from heart attack. And these people are far less likely to recover than our 18, 20 year old co college students. And when we give it to the 18, 20 year old college students, we monitor, did you take this pill when you're meant to take it every day? Whereas in real life, people are out there, they forget to take their pills, they don't want to take their pills or whatever. So the analogy in development is, if we go, say, like we do a small scale trial in one or two villages, and so it's done under ideal settings in that the researchers are part of the implementation team and they're making sure the fidelity of implementation is, is good, the program's meant to be implemented properly. That's like an efficacy trial. When you take it to scale, you're trying to reach 100 villages implemented by an NGO without close monitoring of implementation. And so we'd expect the effect to be much less in an effectiveness trial rather than an efficacy trial. And most of the evidence we have, the high quality RCTs, are efficacy trials. If we scaled up those interventions, then we would expect effectiveness trials to find less impact. And that's a particular issue in, in, in other sectors. So for example, male circumcision, which is recommended across Africa, because there are three efficacy trials that show a 50% reduction in onward transmission of HIV AIDS from unprotected sex if the man is circumcised, the efficacy trials. We don't know what we do know is you roll out male circumcision programs, men don't want to get circumcised, it doesn't happen, but we don't also know what the effectiveness would be once you do trials that are, that are rolled out, and that's a, a gap the 3 is currently working to fill. So that distinction is really important, and we need to do proper, full impact evaluations of scaled up interventions. We can't think, oh, we've done an efficacy trial, so now we can go to scale and stop there because we know it works. You don't know it works, not once you go to scale. I just, uh, we'll have to save the rest of the questions for, for after the, at the last segment. Um, before I pass to Sri, this is, and, and I think the, when the deworming and the Cochrane deworming study came out last year, there was J-PAL South Asia and, and J-PAL has also been promoting school-based deworming as an effective program for, uh, for education in particular. So what I, what I will just point out is that there is, uh, a note that has been put out by the heads of Deworm the World, I believe j -PAL and IPA, countering some of the findings in the, in the Cochrane study. And I don't want to get into the details here, it's, but because uh, it's, there was a great blog post I saw called the Deworming Brouhaha, <laughs> which, which was a lot of back and forth about what studies were included, what the outcome, the outcome variable that we're mostly focusing on is, is uh, school increases in school attendance. I don't want to get into the details right now, but I, I think it just goes to say that it matters which outcomes variables you're looking at, it matters which studies you're looking at. Um, and in general, I think that you know, both Cochrane and, and, and 3IE do a, a very good job of having uh, comprehensive studies. Our next speaker is uh, Berta Snilstweit 
who will present on systematic reviews of farmer field school evaluations. Bertha assists in coordinating and developing 3IE systematic review programs in London. She works with Hugh Waddington in coordinating the Reviews Commission by 3IE and the Campbell Collaboration International Development Coordinating Group. Welcome, Bertha. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, so, we're all um, interested in identifying policies um, that help improve people's lives. And I think the discussion this morning has also showed that many of us are interested in the methods that we use to determining the answers to, that, to those questions. The systematic review that I'm going to present today um, is a good example, I believe, of a review that is achieving both of those ob objectives. So it's making a substantive contribution in terms of um, telling us something about the effects of farmer field schools, but it's also making a methodological contribution in terms of um, um, improving the methods that we use in systematic reviews to provide more um, useful conclusions. <coughs> so, what are farmer field schools? Farmer field schools um, are um, is, is a training program for farmers. It's a group-based learning, typically uh, including 25 farmers, um, and it takes place outdoors in the village and it's based on principles of adult education and discovery based learning so the farmers get to actually practice the techniques that the school is trying to promote in the field and observe the results of the techniques in control plots and they also practice something called agro ecosystem uh, analysis where they um, the aim is that the farmers learn how they can better use the, um, the resources they have available in their environment to combat or deal with some, some of their problems and improve their farming techniques. <coughs> so, just a bit of background on farmer field schools. So, farmer field schools originated in Indonesia in the late 1980s and they were an attempt to deal with a particular problem which was um, widespread uh, or re reoccurring pests and a problem of pests becoming resistant to pesticides. So the, um, the, the FAO helped develop um, the, the farmer field schools and as a way of uh, disseminating integrated pest management which is about um, using beneficial insects in the field, for instance, to, to scout for those insects and to use those to target the pests, replacing pesticides. Um, after having been implemented in Indonesia, uh, farmer field schools have now spread to all regions of the world and they're implemented in over 70 countries. And as they have spread, they, um, the curriculum that's taught in the farmer field school, or the, the practices and the techniques, have been adapted to the particular problems of the local context. So, for instance, in Africa, pests might um, not be the biggest problem of all farmers. Maybe soil fertility is a bigger issue. So the curriculum has been adapted to address those needs. So, <coughs> in the early 2000s, there was um, a, a policy debate and a de debate in the academic literature about the effectiveness of farmer field schools. So, there was this review by, by Vandenberg, which was looking at um, a range of uh, studies of the effects of farmer field schools, which concluded that uh, farmer field schools were effective in... Um, um, achieving a range of beneficial developmental impact. 
Then there was another study conducted by Feder et al, which was, is, is considered the, the first um, rigorous impact evaluation of Pharma Field School. Um, and that was uh, conducted by researchers from the World Bank. And that study concluded that um, the, the Pharma Field School did not improve the, the outcomes of either the farmers that participated in the Pharma Field Schools or their neighbours, because that, that is, because Pharma Field School is, is such an um, intensive programme and um, um, in some cases at least the cost of implementing it is quite high, one of the assumptions for cost effectiveness is that the practices also diffuse to neighbouring farmers. But Feder et al. concluded that um, there were no effects of farm field schools on either. So <coughs> this was the motivation for our review. Um, we <laughs> um, so, so based on this debate, we developed two research questions that we wanted to answer. So we'd, we'd had some experience of doing reviews in the past where we'd been looking at effects. So we wanted to answer what are the impacts of pharma field schools um, on um, outcomes for farmers. So looking at adoption, um, yields, incomes, empowerment, etc. Um, in addition to that, we also wanted to try and uh, understand if the intervention worked or if it didn't work, why was that? So what, what are the barriers and facilitators to farmer field schools um, being effective? So we designed a systematic review which combined what Hugh talked about earlier the, the, and, and those, using those methods where you primarily review the quantitative literature to answer the question about intervention effectiveness with a synthesis of the qualitative literature to address the barriers and facilitators question. So here, was, here are the results of, of our review. So this is just to show you um, quickly, um, this is a, a, a diagram uh, illustrating the results of our research. So you can see at the top, we, we screened close to 28,000 um, records, which seems like a lot, and systematic reviews are often criticised for discarding a lot of, of useful literature, but actually the majority of of those 28,000 records, they were not relevant to either to farmer field schools and, and in particular not to the questions that we were as asking. So actually the, the number that is, is the most relevant is the, um, the number at the second from the bottom, um, which suggests that we, we screened um, around um, 700, the full text of around 700 papers, although there are some, some overlaps to that. And I'd say that that is maybe the size of the pharma field school literature that is possibly relevant and, and, of, and, and its pr primary research. And then in the end, we included 80 impact evaluations um, of pharma field schools. <coughs> Excuse me, and 20 qualitative <coughs> studies in our synthesis. So, I mentioned that we, we did this, um, uh, we had two research questions and we sort of had two streams of the review. And, but a central part of our review, which is bringing those two streams together, is using a program theory. So we drew up a quite basic program theory, <coughs> excuse me, um, for farmer field schools. So one of the the, the first um, intermediate outcome 
um, for farm field scores is that um, the participants um, acquire the knowledge and skills um, Um, that are being um, uh, presented in the farmer field schools. So what our meta-analysis found, this is the results of our meta-analysis, and <coughs> on, on the right-hand side, um, that indicates that the, um, um, the intervention was effective in improving farmers' knowledge. And if it uh, crosses the line or it's, it's over on the, the left-hand side, it indicates that farm field schools were not effective. So at the top, we present the, um, <coughs> the results on the effect uh, of, of farm field schools on participants. So those are the farmers that actually participated in uh, the training. And we find that um, uh, overall, whilst there is some heterogeneity between uh, different contexts, overall, the farmer field schools were su successful in improving farmers' knowledge. <coughs> then, if you see, when we look at um, the results for the neighbours of farmer field school participants, we find that there are no um, statistically significant effects on the neighbours. So um, being exposed to someone who's participated in a farmer field school um, does not appear to, um, to, to pass on the knowledge to, to other farmers. Then our qualitative synthesis provides um, some uh, insights into um, why we see the results that we see, and also um, so both in terms of, of the, the barriers to effectiveness, but also facilitators. So um, a, a, a key factor at the early stages of the causal change is the of course the the quality of the inputs so for farmer field schools the, fas the facilitator who is is running the field school is a key input um, and what the qualitative synthesis um, suggests <coughs> me. Um, was that the um, if, if farmers if the facilitators do not receive sufficient training or sufficient quality of the training, in particular if the training did not focus enough on facilitation skills and in participatory techniques, that could be a, a barrier to them performing their, um, their job properly. Typically many of the facilitators were formerly agricultural extension workers, so they came from a different tradition. So if the, um, the training was not of um, good enough quality, that was a barrier. Also, if the facilitators did not have the appropriate characteristics from the outset, if they were too different from the farmers, um, if they didn't have experience um, <coughs> With farming, that affected um, the extent to which farmers trusted their messages. Um, and finally, if the facilitators used the national language as opposed to local languages, in some cases that was a barrier because the, the farmers were unable to understand what they were saying. Um, on the other hand, a facilitator of of the facilitators being able to, to pass on the knowledge to farmers successfully um, was if, if they were, um, if they had experience with farming, um, if they had leadership skills, 
Um, and um, also that they were literate. In some contexts in particular, it was important that the gender of the farmer was appropriate. So if the farmer field school was targeting um, women, then having a, a female facilitator uh, might be quite important. Although, on the other hand, in some, in some contexts, if, if the group also included men, then... Uh, having a female facilitator um, is not always appropriate. Um, and then additionally, the qualitative synthesis suggested that a barrier to successful um, implementation of farm field school was um, a lack of timely um, and sufficient resources to actually set up the farm field school. <clears throat> so let's move on to the um, our second intermediate outcome which is adoption so me studies that measure whether farmers adopt the practices uh, promoted in farmer field schools so uh, on this slide because it's, um, it's about the um, a reduction of an outcome rather than an increase of an outcome. Um, it's the opposite. So if the, um, the point estimate is on the, the left hand si side of the line, it indicates that the intervention was effective in uh, achieving its outcome. If it's on the right hand side of the line, it suggests that it was not effective in um, reducing pesticide demand among participants. So for the farmer field school participants, so again those that participated directly in the farmer field school, the meta-analysis suggests <coughs> that um, the, the farmer field school were effective in actually getting, in, in, in reducing farmers' demand for pesticides. Thank you. Um, <coughs> but then when we look at the results on, on their neighbours, again, uh, there is no statistically significant effect on uh, farmers being <coughs> exposed to other trained farmers reducing their um, use of pesticides. So for the, in, in the qualitative synthesis, uh, four uh, key themes emerge as, as explanations for, for the results. So firstly, the, the approach to learning adopted in the farm field school appears to be important to determine effectiveness. So I mentioned earlier that this, the uh, participatory approach and discovery-based learning is an important part of the design of the farmer field school. What the uh, synthesis of the qualitative evidence suggests is that in, in some cases, farmer field schools were implemented more in a, in a top-down way as the traditional extension would be delivered. And in those cases, um, whereas we, we can't actually trace that directly back to um, an effect size, it, it suggests that if, um, if, farm, if farm field schools were not sufficiently uh, participatory, that was a, a, a barrier to effectiveness. On the other hand, when the, the, far, the, the approach to learning was more participatory and the farmers were allowed to, um, to, observe, to, to practice the skills in the field, um, that was a facilitator of, of farmers adopting uh, the improved practices. Secondly, relevance 
of the curriculum appears to be a important factor in determining um, effectiveness. So I mentioned earlier that Pharma Field School started in Indonesia and they've now spread to a range of different um, countries. So in some cases it appears that the, the curriculum of the Pharma Field School was not then sufficiently adapted to the local context. So it was not always relevant what farmers were taught in, in farmer field school. They might gain the knowledge, but if they didn't feel that it was relevant to their problems, that might be a barrier to actually adopting the practices in the field. But on the other hand, if the curriculum was adapted to the, the local context, and farmers felt that what what they learned in the farmer field school was relevant to them, then that appears to be a, a facilitator of adoption. <coughs> and thirdly, um, observability um, seems to be an important explanatory factor. So part of the farmer field school is to the use of control plots where farmers get to compare um, their traditional practices with the improved practices. So if, far, if, if in some cases those control plots actually failed to produce a uh, convincing uh, result, so in those cases that was a barrier to, to adoption. On the other hand, if farmers were able to observe the, the benefits of the new practices, either in the control plots or in their field, that was convincing that the, the, the practice had a relative advantage and was worth adopti op adopting. And then finally, the policy context matters for adoption. So in some countries, there might be a policy of providing agricultural so subsidies to uh, of, of pesticides or or fertilizers, and if the the farm field school was then trying to encourage farmers to reduce their use of pesticides or reduce uh, replace fertilizers with other more uh, natural techniques, then that might be a challenge for farmers to to adopt the new practices in those contexts. And also in many countries, the, the, the pesticide industry appeared to be quite powerful still, and the old links between the pesticide industry and the agricultural extension system could also act as a barrier to adoption. And <coughs> finally, looking at the effect of farmer field school on final outcomes for farmers. And I'm, I'm only going to focus on a couple here. You can see the rest in our report. Um, so we're now back to, so it's about yield increases. So on the right hand side suggests um, a beneficial impact and indeed for the Farmers that participated in farmer field schools, um, there was an um, an increase in yields. Whereas for the the exposed farmers or the the, the neighbours of the um, participants, there were no statistically significant impact. And then <coughs> looking at the the revenues for farmers, so w one of the, um, the benefits of suggested of um, integrated pest management, for instance, is that it reduces the, the cost um, of, of inputs for farmers. Um, so we find that for farmer field school participants, there was a beneficial impact on revenues and there were also a group of farmer field school which uh, had an, an additional component of um, 
input on marketing support. And there again, we observe a, um, a beneficial effect on, on revenues. In this case, we also actually observe a beneficial effect on the, the neighbours of participating farmers, which is um, inconsistent with the, the rest of the, the meta-analysis results. So <coughs> our explanation for this, and, and Hugh might elaborate on this later, um, is that so, so these results are fr from only um, two studies? Well, actually, there are three on here. Um, but so we, we suggest that maybe these results are not that reliable. There are some issues with um, the, n the number of studies and also the quality of the studies. <coughs> so the, the story that's kind of running through our um, meta-analysis and, and synthesis along the causal chain is that whilst there is an effect on the farmer, uh, farmers who participate in farmer field schools, there are no effects on those that don't. So there is a, a breakdown in the causal chain, so no diffusion effect happens. So why, why do we see no diffusion? Well, the, the practices promoted in farmer field schools are relatively complex so it's not just about knowledge and transmission of information, it's, it's about practicing and, and learning new skills. And I'm sure that we've all got experience of, of trying to uh, learn a new skill, and it's not always possible to do that by having people tell us how to do it. We did a qualitative synthesis by... We, we learned to do it by doing it. We, we read a lot about it beforehand, but we didn't really understand what it involved before we did it. So that also appeared to apply to, to farmer field schools. Um, and another factor which, which farmers reported was that so the, the, um, the exposed farmers, they were generally unable to observe the, the benefits, and, and some of the benefits with uh, the practices promoted in farmer field schools are not immediately obvious in farmers' fields, so that was one issue, and therefore they were not convinced of the relative advantage of adopting the new practices. And finally, socio-economic differences between the the participants in the farmer field schools and their neighbours appear to have been a barrier to, um, to adoption. And in, in some cases, the, the, so the social networks of the participating farmers did not extend much beyond the group of 25 farmers who, who participated in the farmer field school. And, and, some, and I think these, these three factors are consistent with um, Roger's theory of, of diffusion. So it's a characteristic of the farmer field school intervention which suggests that it might be difficult for it to diffuse spontaneously. So to conclude, the evidence suggests that farmer field schools are effective in improving the practices and agricultural outcomes of um, farmer field school participants. It seems that it's important that the farmer field schools are implemented in a participatory, um, experience based manner, and that the, um, the curriculum is adapted to the local context. But the, the practices do not diffuse to um, exposed farmers and neighbouring farmers and as I just said that this appeared to be related to the the characteristics of the farmer field school intervention primarily. So it seems like to to achieve diffusion outcomes of farmer field schools and also so I haven't reported anything about sustainability but for, to achieve diffusion and sustainability 
it seems like an, an additional um, additional support and, and um, uh, backstopping might be uh, necessary. And finally, um, I think that uh, systematic reviews using a program theory and combining different types of evidence can produce more useful conclusions and I think that our review has, has showed that. Thank you. Let's again <coughs> take a round of uh, Hello, good morning. Uh, I am Anas Raut from Microinter Initiative. Uh, usually used to do uh, literature reviews uh, during our publications, uh, writing publications, uh, but in systematic reviews like what we have seen here and we used to be doing in vitamin A like coverage evaluations and uh, we see like a lot of studies have efficacies. A uh, lot of studies don't uh, see, we don't see efficacies, but when you do a uh, systematic review, we see that how many studies we are going to take, like to see that whether uh, the positive outcomes, uh, we are going to take the positive outcomes or uh, negative outcomes, whether there is a, like, there is a rule of uh, thumb rule or something, or whether we think like uh, we can get uh, close to any kind of number of studies which we get access to through electronic or any means. Thank you. Uh, I'm more interested, hi, I'm Preetha Menon from Public Health Foundation of India, and I'm more interested in how you went about doing a qualitative synthesis, the process. Uh, did you limit it to just the studies that you took up for the quantitative uh, meta-analysis? Was it a subset of that? Or did you take up other studies which had just the qualitative aspect and not uh, the quantitative part? And even among uh, the, the findings that you're getting from uh, the different review that you did, uh, did you filter it? Uh, like, did you take out those studies that didn't have a good uh, impact or uh, a substantial uh, what you call effect size? Did you filter it uh, across those uh, studies? Or uh, did you take it all in one go? And how do you know uh, that the findings, if there is a situation where you have conflicting uh, um, findings, like one study says this is good, the other one says this is not. So how do you uh, take a, a call on that? And the fourth uh, doubt again that comes here is how do you uh, look into the quality of the qu uh, qualitative studies that you do? Like which ones do you take or which do you think uh, haven't been done with the rigor that that should be um, in a qualitative study. And I'm going to add to to her question if you if I can. What, one question I have just related is is for each step on the causal chain. So you you basically had knowledge transfer, adoption, and yield, and in, in out, final outcomes. Do you find on, across the studies that you're doing that there are those there must be those consistent results that are that are available and comparable or those, those kind of universal air indicators that are comparable across studies and then the second one because i know that's a, a challenge for j when we do cost effectiveness analysis is sometimes those studies don't have the same outcome variables and then the second question related is is basically can you say a little bit about how you weight the studies so because in the meta-analysis it seems to me that you're putting together um, you're, you're, you're looking at the total observations for a particular study, and then you're, you're putting that together with other observations from other studies. So if my study had 6,000 observations and, and uh, Howard's only had 200, then it seems like my study, would <laughs> <coughs> my study would kind of dominate the results. And so I know that you do some kind of weighting, but I just would like to hear a little more about that. Hi, Prithas actually already asked the question I was going to ask uh, about qualitative research more generally and the use in, in systematic reviews. Because so many of the studies are ethnographies and so context specific. So just wondering about the challenges of using studies like them in a more, um, I mean, how do you compare one with the other? Uh, the purpose of qualitative research is so different from the studies that we use. 
Yeah, I'm Nupur Barwa from DFID South Asia Research Hub. Yeah, uh, my question is a related one. I mean, how do you, you know, uh, kind of uh, decide which kind of, what kind of the research studies you are going to do for, you know, systematic review? And what are the, you know, uh, how is it different from the meta-analysis we do? I mean, what are the advantages of doing that systematic review, which you have covered already, but I just want some specific answers for that. And the, she has also pointed about the qualitative thing, what are the methodologies used? Thanks. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Chandan from USA. <clears throat> okay. So the first question, how many studies should we include? So the aim of systematic review is to identify all studies that meet your inclusion criteria. So if you're looking at the effect, so we were looking at the effect of pharma field schools on, on farmers' outcomes, then we want to try and identify all studies that um, address that question. And that involves looking at both the published and the unpublished literature, writing emails to experts, etc. And one of the reasons for, for doing that is to, to vo avoid publication bias, so that we also, so commonly the reviews, the studies that find negative or, or non-significant results are less likely to be published. And you also asked whether there is a point where there are there is a, there is an upper limit of, of number of studies. So ag again, we want to include all of the available studies. Although I do think that there might be a point where, if there are s a sufficient number of high quality studies, we can say that we we're, we're quite confident in the answer to this question. So we don't need to fund more impact evaluations um, yeah. and then in terms of the questions so I'm going to, to deal um, primarily with the, the questions on the, the qualitative synthesis on the, the farm field schools review and then Hugh who's, who's led the work on, on the quant will address the, the questions relating to the meta-analysis so I will start with the so the inclusion criteria and, and the process of, of how we did that. So as, as with the quant, we, we set out at the beginning the, the types of studies that we wanted to include. And we adopted a, a minimum criteria for the qualitative studies for them to be included in the first round. So that they had to report some information about objectives, some information about sampling, and some information about the sample. Not a lot of detail, but just a, a bit of information. And so then we, we sifted through a lot of studies and identified those that were of sufficient minimum quality. And then we used a, so there are around 100 different checklists and tools for assessing the quality of qualitative studies. So we combined a couple of those um, into to a checklist that, that we applied to all the studies. So we were two people assessing the quality independently and then resolved any, um, any issues um, with the advice from a third person. And then we extracted data from, from, the, from the findings of the studies. So detailed line by line coding. And and first we extracted quite a lot of information and it it was a pro process of, of reading it and, and, and rereading it and actually drawing out the, the common themes and we started with the coding framework which was um, based on our our program theory and what what I didn't show on the slide because it, it looks very messy is that we have also a range of assumptions underlying each step of the causal chain. So those were things that influenced our, our coding. Um, also, Roger's theory of diffusion was, was informative in, in the coding framework. And then there were several stages of, of, of iterations of, of trying to, to synthesize um, the concepts and, and, and drawing out 
um, obviously keeping keeping the the context of um, whether a particular factor was what was a barrier and, and what was a, a facilitator. <coughs> so what we've produced now at the end is so there's a write up of this and we have um, updated the program theory with with additional assumptions that we we think that based on the quality of evidence need to hold for the the farmer field schools um, interventions to be effective. And we also have a separate model where we kind of graphically illustrate the, the barriers and facilitators. And then there was a question about um, ethnographies and, and, and how, how you combine uh, those studies. I think that is the, it is a, a tension in qualitative synthesis, um, whether you should take context-specific findings and combine them. I think having done it, I think that they can still, and I think the way that we present them is that these are, these are suggestive factors and they, might, they, they do not necessarily apply in, in all contexts, but I think that they are still useful in informing implementation and, and, and practice in, in, in other contexts that can be useful lessons. Um, I think that there was the gentleman at the back. Did, did have I addressed uh, your? You know, the, how, how do you select the, these studies to do a systematic review? How, what is the you know kind of the qualifying things? You know, like there, there will be two thousand, three thousand studies. How do you you know segregate and decide which are ones you want to do a detailed <coughs> ones? So, so based on your research question, you define your inclusion criteria in, in relation to the population, the intervention, um, the comparisons and the outcomes that the, the studies need to look at for you to include them. For the qualitative synthesis, the, we, we don't look at the, obviously at the comparisons and outcomes, but we look at um, factors related to the um, barriers and facilitators of, of farmer field schools. So those are the criteria that we have, and then we apply them first at the title stage, at the abstract stage, and then we, we read the full text of all the papers and base th that kind of filter through our screening and decide which uh, papers are relevant for our research questions. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So just to elaborate on this point about the qualitative synthesis mainly, Systematic reviews traditionally, particularly those done by the Cochrane Collaboration, which is public health, but also the Campbell Collaboration, of which we're part, which uh, looks at social interventions, have focused on quantitative synthesis using sometimes meta-analysis, sometimes not. And we did mention, and it, I believe it to be true, that 3i is bring, bringing substantial uh, innovation in techniques to the field of SR, systematic reviews. And this is primarily, not only, it's also on the quantitative side, but primarily on the qualitative side. And the way in which we're doing that is to ensure the same principles of systematic review techniques are applied in the qualitative field. There's nothing inherent about systematic reviews that makes it quantitative. What systematic review requires to be is systematic. And so, as Berta said, you want to capture all relevant literature. So you do do a very comprehensive search which shows, as the table showed, you find 20,000 studies. It's not unusual you start 20,000 studies and you come down to 10 or 12 included studies. You've, you actually have been through 20,000 studies to get down to that, those 10 or 12. As, as Berta mentioned in her presentation, people often get upset when you're throwing away 19,994 studies but it's not actually that big number that matters. A lot of those won't be relevant. There'll be published in material from NGOs and some stuff you find in your searches that clearly are not studies of the impact or any other part of the causal chain. So you come down to 200, 300, 
And as Berta was saying in her presentation, it's the step down from those two and 300 down to the 10 or 12 included studies where you're making the critical decisions. And you might be looking at effectiveness, the impact of the intervention on the outcomes, which is typically, they're not always quantitative, but you might be looking at other steps of the causal chain, like the barriers and facilitators to adoption. And the key question your inclusion criteria is, is this credible evidence? And what you need is some inclusion criteria allows you to decide if this evidence is credible or not. This is not something some bloke I met at the pub told me. Yeah? This is something I can demonstrate I've got some scientific methodology. And so, as Bert was saying, people need to be explicit about their methodology. And a lot of our inclusion criteria are about being able to judge whether it's credible evidence because their methodology for collecting those data are clear. Now, we know in ethnography you don't do random sampling, and we're, we're fine with that. Ethnographic studies do get included in the qualitative synthesis. And so it's about knowing that it's clear what the methodology was so you can include that study. And then we're systematic in the synthesis of the data from the qualitative studies. Because all the while, we're trying to avoid cherry picking. It's one of the problems with literary reviews, because you haven't got systematic inclusion criteria, people can ignore studies that don't fit in with their argument and only include those that do. A systematic review won't allow you to do that. And the way I like to do this, I'm, and, uh, but it's, we have some differences of opinion here, um, is what I call an evidence matrix. And the evidence matrix you have, each row is an intervention, each column is some issue you're looking at, and you fill in the cells. From every study you've got, you fill in the cell on the evidence matrix, from the data you have in the study, and you can then do what we call a vertical synthesis down the column, all the data you have on that particular issue from the qualitative studies, and a horizontal synthesis that allows you to read across the causal chain of the data in that particular study. So these are systematic ways of collecting and analyzing this data, and that's what's key to a systematic review. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have anything more to say. <laughs> okay, so um, just on the uh, questions about the meta-analysis, um, well, actually, there were questions on the pooling of findings, um, what do you do about um, studies showing big effects and studies showing small effects, or high quality versus low quality, or positive and negative effects. Basically, this is, this is why we do meta-analysis, because what, what, what it enables us to do by um, doing, um, by weighting the studies according to the inverse of the, the variance, which is essentially um, closely related to the sample size. So studies with big samples get weighted more heavily than studies with small samples. Um, by looking across all of these studies, we, we say something about what the average treatment effect is looking across all the studies under the assumption um, that, um, to use uh, statistical power, it probably isn't statistical parlance, but, but under the assumption that um, um, n all of our studies, they're not necessarily from the same sample population, but the only differences which, I which, um, ex uh, which explain across findings in addition to chance are, are contextual factors. So, so the methods that we use um, are, are statistically valid in enabling us to do that. Now, what we don't believe is that actually just looking across all of the studies is, is the whole or even the main answer. And we do believe that looking at heterogeneity and impacts according, contextu according to contextual factors, according to good versus, uh, which includes things like low versus high quality, good, uh, low versus high quality studies, um, um, looking at whether we have outliers and what the reasons are for those outliers in terms of particularly large or particularly negative effects. There was a slide that Berta had on, on this, which, which um, she had to cut out at the last minute, I think. Um, so um, a, a really good study, and uh, unfortunately it's a bit dependent on how many, sp uh, obviously as you, as you cut the evidence down, um, to few and fewer studies. You have fewer studies in, in each subgroup analysis, so it's a bit dependent on the total number of studies. Um, um, but, but you can say something about, about, answer all of these questions, and this is what we try to do in the report as, as much as we possibly can based on the number of studies. Um, yes, there were lots of outcome measures, so there, there isn't really a, um, um, th there aren't ex exactly standard outcome reports um, reporting so studies on yield um, studies on um, adoption rates some would measure ad adoption in terms of um, uh, number of pesticide sprayings others was others would 
uh, measure it in terms of the volume of liquid sprayed, others in terms of the cost of the spray. So um, we did collect and code that, um, and we've what Berta presented was the overall synthesis. But when we when we actually look at when we Dis dis disaggregate by the different types of outcomes, uh, we don't actually see any differences and that's why we present the, over the overall findings still. Um, also, the way that we calculate, the we've used res response ratios which are a bit like the risk ratios um, f in terms of measuring the effect size. So you measure the change in the treatment group divided by the change in the control group and that actually um, um, measures everything in, in analogous to a percentage change, which also enables, which is a, a unit, you know, which enables you to account for um, contextual units of, of, of analysis. Um, I th yes, that was, oh, oh, what? And apparently we have to go and get on a plane, so I'm going to stop. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, f first, uh, so now we have about 10, 15 minutes for coffee outside. Um, and Berta and Hugh, I just want to thank you very much for joining us today, especially squeezing us in before your flight. Uh, let's give them a round of applause before we go to uh, <laughs> your flight. Great, so let's, let's have coffee outside. We'll have to bring, probably inevitably, have to, some people have to bring it back in um, so we can aim to start about 10 or 15 minutes from now.